Hello there everyone, welcome to the very first video of Flamebait Talks. I of course am your host, Flamebait, or you can just call me Flame. Now, I would like to put a little disclaimer at the front of this video. Um, we are going to be talking about some subjects that might make people uncomfortable. Um, this video is about sexual assault awareness and prevention and I am going to be talking about my experience, and if that is something that makes you uncomfortable, I suggest that you join us again on a different video. Um, if you are in for the long haul, I am going to go ahead and dive right in. Uh, as I had spoken about in the introductory video, the first episode here is about sexual assault awareness and prevention. And that, of course, is because of the month of April, which is kind of the official month for that here in the United States. Um, this is a subject that is extremely important to me, and I know it's a bit on the heavy side, especially for a first official YouTube video. Um, but as a victim and a survivor, I feel that it is important for me to try to do my part and let people know, hey, you aren't alone. Um, and that's pretty much what this whole video is going to be about. So let's just get to it then. Um, so, my experience with sexual assault occurred when I was young, uh, too young, actually. I was eight years old, and this occurred with a family member, um, which statistically is smaller um, compared to a lot of other instances, but most of the time, a sexual assault or rape does occur with someone that the victim knows. Um, I was very unfortunate in the fact that it also happened to be a family member that as a young boy I, I looked up to and loved very much and idolized at one point in my life. Uh, in my family, every summer, the kids are kind of traded around a bit. That not no not 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 like that. I realized that that came out bad. Um, <laughs> my family is very old world in the sense that they believe that it takes a village to raise a child. Um, it is not just the responsibility of the parents; it is the whole family. Um, so I would kind of go and I would spend a lot of time with grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins. My extended family was less removed than some other families, uh, some families that you all might have been raised in. It was much more close-knit. Um, there are cousins that I honestly thought when I was much younger were my brothers and sisters because we spent so much time together and I did not see any different, any variation between the two. And it's because of that that I was put in the care of my uncle one summer. Um, originally we had a very good familial relationship and much like how I said earlier he kind of considered me one of his own kids um, but the winter before I came he ended up losing his wife and one of his kids in an accident and it tore him apart and he became a completely different person. It was someone that none of us recognized. And 
it was kind of hoped that, you know, keeping him a part of the family and, you know, continuing to do the things that we had always done would kind of rekindle the person that we used to know. But it never did. Um, I had been there for a couple weeks, and I don't exactly remember what I did. Um, I know we were playing with, I was playing with my other cousins, and I think we were, we were playing some sort of ball game, um, and I ended up knocking over much by accident, I do promise you that, one of my other cousins, and they scraped their arm. And my uncle was very upset about this, and he took me back to the house and he was telling me that I played too rough, that I needed to be careful, and it kept building up at that point. It became less of a correction, and it moved to a chastisement, and then it moved to criticism, and finally he literally just got so upset that he punched me in the face. My uncle was in his late 30s, and I was 8 years old, and I didn't know what to do with that. It hurt, and I cried. I cried because it hurt. But mostly I cried because it was him, uh, this man that meant so much to me. And I felt horrible about the whole thing because in my mind it was my fault. Like I had done something that was so bad that he felt that he had to hurt me. And I was shocked. Um... Honestly, I feel like my uncle was kind of shocked too because I had never seen that look on his face either. It was, he turned pale and he kind of straightened me up. He cleaned me up. He was like, look, that I didn't mean for that to happen. As far as you're concerned, it didn't happen. Just just be more careful, go out and play. And that was the last thing he said for, to me for that week. And I spent all of that time thinking, oh no, he's not talking to me now. He's so mad that he hit me and now he's not talking to me. And I was distraught by this. Um, little did I know that he had also gotten into drinking and several different drugs to try to cope with his own pain and his own grieving. And they did not mix well, of course, and they did not make him and as a lot of times those substances turn out to do for people. Um, so at the end of that week, we were doing something, and I remember him coming in and grabbing me by the back of the shirt. He dragged me into the other room, and he started hitting me again. This time for no reason. And this time it was a lot more and it was a lot harder. And I... I just assumed that it was me. That it was my fault. That I was, I was a bad kid. And that everything that was happening I, I deserved. And a lot of that continued through most of the summer. 
until the last couple weeks. And that's when it happened. Um, I, of course, eight years old, I had never really heard about sex. I had no idea, you know, what the act was, let alone that it could happen. Um, one night he came into my room completely wasted. He was drunk off out of his gourd, <laughs> to put it more nicely, and I'm sure he had been doing other drugs too. And he came over to me. He was saying things that didn't make sense. And I was terrified because I thought that I was going to get beat again. And instead, he crawled into the bed with me. And I was raped. I, I had no thoughts, no words to describe any of the things that I felt, any of the uncomfortableness, the pain, the betrayal. I couldn't articulate what that was. Um, he pretty much left me alone the last week that I was there. On the day my parents came to get me, he pulled me to the side and he told me that if I told them anything that had happened while I was there, that the next time he got a hold of me, he would kill me. And I, my experience with, you know, death was very limited at that time. I had only lost a great grandparent, which I didn't know very well. I wasn't a hundred percent sure what death completely entailed. So when it became clear that I was confused, he made it clear that if I told anyone, that would, that would be it. I would never see anyone ever again. Um, that I would never do anything ever again. And he, he drove home the point as to what that finality is, or was. And of course it terrified me. It would terrify anyone. I spent most of that next year, through fall, winter, and spring, in a complete daze. I had, I had no idea what to make of what happened to me nor did I have any idea of how to handle it. I was terrified for my life. I was terrified for my parents. I didn't want it to happen again, and I thought, you know, if I just, if I just kept my mouth shut, that would be the end of it. And it's not something that would ever happen again. It's not something that I'd ever have to go through ever again. The following summer, I was sent back to him, and up to that point, I, I begged my parents if I could maybe spend some time with my aunt or with one of my other 
uh, family members. I I even asked if I could go spend the summer with my brother, who was much older than me, and he was already out of the house. I begged to go anywhere else but there. And they didn't know why. And when they asked me, I... I wanted to tell them so much, but I didn't, and I couldn't. So I went back. And very little beknownst to me, he had been doing much more drugs and alcohol than what he had the previous summer. And almost as soon as my parents had left and we were inside, he hit me. He hit me several times. He drug me downstairs into the basement and he threw me in a closet. And I stayed there for pretty much the whole summer. Except when he decided to come down and defile me. And that happened many more times. Uh, there was a time during all of this, during the worst it had ever been, I thought, I thought that he really was going to kill me, and I legitimately prayed at the time that he would, because then it would be done, it would be over, I would not have to go through it ever again, I wouldn't have to be here, I wouldn't have to lie. And all the time, I'm still thinking that it's me. That I'm the one that did something bad here. When my parents came to pick me up that summer, I, I was a mess. I was bruised and cut <laughs> and broken and not to mention all of the emotional wounds that I had endured and it tore my parents apart. They, they had never conceived that this was something that could happen to someone that was in their family, that someone in their family could do this, let alone that someone in their family could do this to their child. And I was a shell. I really was. I, I turned off everything after that. It took me a very long time to figure out how to interact with people again. And to this day, I still have social anxiety. And it's mainly because of that. Because one of the first things that pops into my head is, Okay, I have no idea what this person is capable of. But I know what someone that says they love me can do. And that has hindered a lot of friendships and relationships and everything else over the years. There was, of course, a trial once everything came out. Um, he did go to prison. Um, not nearly long enough. Uh, I was actually distraught last year 
um, because he was let out <laughs> on good behavior, which for certain crimes I don't think should be a possibility. Um, but I mean, 20 years <laughs> in prison did not seem like enough. It still doesn't seem like enough. Um, I, I am very upset about that to this day. Um, I, I don't see myself ever not being upset about that. And it's totally okay to be upset, um, especially in this situation, because the damage that was done to me did not stop when I was nine years old. That continued on the majority of it all the way through middle school and into the first part of high school. Some of it even lurks around today. I, as I went into high school, um, I started to notice changes in myself. Um, I started to notice that I had an inclination more towards other guys than I did girls. Um, this became more apparent as hormones started raging out of control and I started getting aroused in the gym room. Um, so that was not fun, of course. And I remember sitting in my room one night and then just curling up into a ball and screaming because my mind made a connection that it should never have made because it wasn't true. It wasn't true at all. But when you are hurt and you don't know what to do, your mind does things that, well, it shouldn't. And in that particular instance, my mind was trying to make the connection. Well, if you like guys, why, why do you like guys? Why, why can't you like girls? Is this because of what he did? Did, did you enjoy that? And again, it's not something that was true. Something like that is never true. So if any of you out there are having those kinds of thoughts, that's not, it's not. Don't think like that. It's something that was completely unavoidable for me, I guess. You know, I always knew that I was gay, it just never really came out until then, because I didn't really know what to do with it. But at the time, it was the possible, it was possibly the worst thing that I could ever be thinking, and it was the worst thing that I could ever be. And after a couple days of this, I decided that I couldn't do that. I couldn't be that. And I decided that the best way out of it would be for me to take my own life. And I decided to take a handful of sleeping pills and go to sleep. And and that would be it. That'd be that'd be done. But the unexpected happened. And I woke up the next day. I was extremely lucky in that. Extremely lucky. At the time, I didn't really know what to do with it. Um, my family has two different 
religions telling me different things, and I'm not necessarily a religious person, but as it was part of my upbringing, you know, part of me did think that maybe that was some kind of sign. I didn't, I didn't die when my uncle was to the point where he almost killed me, and I didn't die when I tried to take my own life. And maybe that meant that I was supposed to do something, that I was supposed to rise above it somehow. And at the time, I very much did not know how to do that. I turned to a lot of friends, um, small amount of family, because of everything that happened. I was very not sure how to deal with family, still, uh, even being 16. Eventually, I got to the point where I was okay being gay, and two of my very dear friends, um, who I will simply call uh, Lola and Kix. They were aware of everything that happened to me, and they told me that it wasn't my fault, that there was no part of that situation that was my fault. And I think I just needed to hear it from someone else. Um, I had never really done therapy when I was younger because I, I didn't talk about it. I didn't want to talk about it. And talking about it is one of the hardest things to do. Because for me, it was, it was not only reliving it, but it was also putting it out into the world and letting someone else know, and then knowing that they were imagining all of it. So it was hard for me to get to that point. It was hard for me to get to the point where I trusted these two wonderful women enough to tell me that I'm okay, that I'm not damaged, that everything that happened was not my fault. So I can tell you right here and right now, if this is something that has happened to you, that none of it, none of it was your fault. It will never be okay, the things that happen to you. There's nothing that can make that okay. No, no court can do enough to ever make that okay. But you will get to the point where you are better. You know, you are not, you are not some fragile, damaged thing. You are a person, and you have the ability to rise above this. You have the ability to take a stand and say, yes, this happened to me, but you know what? I can do my part and make sure that it doesn't happen to anyone else. I can do my part and make sure that people know that they are not alone. And that if they need to talk to someone that this has happened to before, they can come to me. And that's part of one of the things that I would actually like to do with you all here. If there is anyone that is watching this that is a victim or is a survivor of sexual assault, violence, or rape, I want you to know that I am 100% here for you. Um, you can actually reach me 
at my personal email, which is flamebaittox at gmail.com. That's F-L-A-M-E dot B-A-I-T-T-A-L-K-S at gmail.com. I might not see it right away, but I promise you within 24 hours, I will respond because you are not alone. This is not something that you have to handle alone. We are all survivors, we are all victims, and we are all here to support each other and make sure that we help each other to rise above this. Um, also, I am going to add it into the links here below, um, but I also want to make sure that some resources are available. Um, you can also go to www.rain.org dash S-A-A-P-M and you can also go to www.nsvrc.org dash S-A-A-M um, Both of these are very good sites um, that will have more on Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Month. They will have downloads, they will have workshops on what you can do to help. Um, they will also have other resources, like who you can reach out to if you need to talk to someone, or uh, places that you can go if, if you are still in danger. Um, there's also a couple numbers that I want everyone here to be aware of. You can go to 1-800-656-HOPE. That's 1-800-656-4673. That is the Sexual Assault Awareness Hotline. It is a helpline. They can talk to you. They can do whatever they can to try to help you through whatever emotions that you are feeling. Also, because it does inevitably have this effect on a lot of people, and it most certainly did on me, I would also like to make sure that the resource for a uh, anti-self-harm and suicide hotline is available. Um, the one that I have listed below is 1-800-DON'T-CUT. Um, again, that's one 800 366-8288. Um, if there is anyone that is outside of the United States that is watching this, um, I will do my best to find some sort of international link um, that will give you whatever resources you might need. And also, I would like to, you know, kind of wrap up this part of the video by saying, if and I hope not, I, I really hope not, but if any of you that are watching this are still being victimized, are still being abused, do not wait. Please, please, please call 911 and get help. If you are afraid of what will happen to you if you are caught with a phone, try to find some way to get a message out in any social situation even if it's just to write you know a note on a napkin in a restaurant and put it on the side for your server they can see it these people can can try to help you even if it's just you know stopping in to get you know a pack of gum or cigarettes or something at a gas station Try to find a way to get a message to someone that can get you help. If you have the ability to get away from this person that is doing this to you, then then go. Call, call for help and you go where you feel safe. It doesn't matter if it's a longtime friend, a family member, a co-worker, someone that is an acquaintance that you know wouldn't hurt you. Just remove yourself from that situation because this, this does not need to continue to happen to you. You are wonderful and you are beautiful and you are better and you deserve 
so much more than that. And I am telling you that from the heart, because it's true. And whatever this person is doing to you, and whatever they are saying to you, none of that, none of what they're saying is true. All of what they're doing is horrible. And you, you need to go. So I, I will leave that part of the video there. Um, if anyone is interested in doing their part, again, I suggest to go to www.rain.org. Um, they also have a bunch of different downloads that you can use for social media like Instagram and Twitter, um, just with different statistic things. Um, if you want to show your support, if you are a victim or a survivor um, on Thursdays, you can always wear a blue triangle on your right hand. That way other victims and survivors can identify you if they are afraid to seek help on their own. Um, if you're like me on Instagram and Twitter, I also did a sign where I'm holding a hashtag me too. Um, because it's good to let people know, hey, this happens. Hey, this happened to me. And make them aware. Because most people, they, they go about their lives. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that, of course. But they go about their lives and they don't think about all of the big things. And that's what part of this video was about trying to raise awareness. All right, uh, the very next video that I'm going to be working on is probably going to be something a little more lighthearted. I am actually going to be putting up a few things on my Instagram and Twitter asking people what they would like to see in a video. Um, I'm going to throw a few things on there for the furry fandom, that way I can keep it a little more lighthearted and you can find out a little bit more about this guy. Um, also might have some how-to videos. Um, despite everything that had happened in my past, I actually became a bartender because I like kind of being a host and being able to make sure that everyone is having a good time. Um, so I might step out of the office here and take everything downstairs and kind of whip some things up at the bar um, if that's something that everyone would be interested in. Um, I'm sure I'll have some other options in there as well so make sure you visit me on Twitter or Instagram just so you can put your vote in and we can see which one wins. All right that is pretty much going to be it for this one. I will expect my next video to be out on hope Hopefully Monday, but just in case, possibly Tuesday. Um, I will try not to push it back any further than that. Um, all right, that's pretty much it. As always, I hope that you keep it sizzling, and thank you for joining in. Bye!